Hi there, welcome to the new video. Today we'll be talking about this paper which is titled as Neural Data Augmentation via Example Extrapolation. This is from Google Research and it came out this year itself in the month of February. So let's start with the abstract. So the paper proposes a data augmentation approach that uses neural network to do example extrapolation. If you only have certain handful of examples for any distribution or let's say any class, which is a very common thing if you're dealing with real world scenarios. So let's think of a problem statement, let's say toxic comment classification that was active on Kaggle some time back, I think. So there you'll find a high imbalance in the class distribution as most of the comments won't be toxic and only few would be toxic. So in such scenarios, people usually prefer going about doing data augmentation for underrepresented slice or distribution. So this paper talks exactly those things and shows a significant improvement over state of the art models for the task of relation extraction, intent classification and slot filling. So if we see this example, let's consider this to be our original data set. We have four classes, smiley, gesture, animal and food. So for these three classes, we have enough samples, let's say, and this is our underrepresented slice because we have very less sample comparatively to all these three slices. So here the definition of a slice basically depends on the practitioner who is trying to model a problem. So it could be as simple as grouping examples by label and saying them as a slice. So here smiley is one slice, gesture could be another slice, animal is third slice and the food is the fourth slice. And similarly in the case of toxic comment classification, is toxic zero could be one of the slices, is toxic one could be one of the slices. So that's one way of defining slices or you could also go about defining certain grammatical structures and define your slices based on that or even the case of multilingual setting, you could group by language identified, let's say French could be one of the slices, the examples from English could be one of the slices and so on and so forth. So again, it's up to the practitioners to how does he decide. So let's consider we have slices based on the label for now. So once you have this kind of a data set, the next task what they do is to train a sequence to sequence model, which is trained over a pre-trained T5 model. So if you're not sure what T5 is, I already have a video on that. I link to that in the I button, make sure to check that out. But if I have to explain you what T5 does, it's a typical sequence to sequence architecture that's based on transformers model. And also as the name suggests, it takes text as inputs and produces text as the output. So it doesn't deal with any kind of other formats. And it is a single model that deals with many tasks at a time. Let's say you could also do a summarization, you could do a translation, you could do a classification, all of that can be done. And at the output end, the relative outputs would be produced, but that is also formatted in a text format. So let's say if your classification says not toxic, then you would model this as two words. If your tokenization scheme is splitting at word level, and your model is supposed to predict those two words. So yeah, that way it's kind of doing everything from taking text as the input and also outputting class labels as text. So since I mentioned like this is a single model that takes care of multiple tasks at a time, and since it is text to text, the loss is cross entropy that flows backward. But the authors of T5 also propose the concept of prefix, which you add as a trigger to kind of tell model what task you want to perform. So let's say for summarize, you would have summarize then colon, for translation, you could have translate English to French, colon, and similarly for classification and other tasks. So this prefix, what you see, right, tells the model to kind of focus on the weights that kind of trigger this specific task, which eventually model ends up using those to get the correct output. So yeah, that's a pretty much very high overview of how T5 works, but I'll still recommend you to go to that video and see a more detailed version to how T5 worked and what experiment did the author do. So yeah. This EX2 is again trained on the top of this T5 model. So let's say you would have such sequence as input and you're supposed to predict one of the examples from the same distribution. Again, from another slice, let's say for animals, you sample some K samples from there and you output one of the sample from that same slice. And like this, you do it for all the overrepresented slices that you have. Once you do this basic training, we come to step C, where you now show your model the examples from underrepresented slice and pass it through the pre-trained model that you already have now. And we expect the model to output something from the same distribution. So let's say food slice was underrepresented. We pass in some K samples from that underrepresented slice and we expect the model to output something that belongs to the same distribution. So that way we are kind of doing a data augmentation and we are increasing that underrepresented slice. Now let's drill down further. How do they define the problem statement formally? So these are the high level steps that they define under the overview section for their paper. The first is to organize the training data into multiple slices, which we have already seen. Like at the basic level, you could kind of group by at the label level if you're doing a classification problem. 
Then you train your example extrapolator from the data from those slices, which is the fine tuning phase over the T5 model. Then you use that trained model to kind of generate new synthetic data for the underrepresented slice for the data set, which we saw as the food example, wherein we sampled K samples from the food slice and we generated, let's say, lettuce over there. So that way we're kind of doing the data augmentation for that slice. And once you're done with data augmentation by leveling the classes and so on, you train a student model over the union of the synthetic data and the real data that you have. So this will be the final classification model that kind of you deploy in the production systems that does a classification given some input sample. So yeah, let's move forward. So if we talk about some formal definitions, they denote the example E as X comma Y, where X is the input and Y is the output, which would mean, let's say for text classification problem, play a song would be the X. And if we want to know the intent, which is the Y value, that would be play music. And now talking about how do you slice the data? So the algorithm, which is example extrapolation EX2, doesn't make any assumption to how the data is sliced. So yeah, that's what we discussed earlier. It could be about sharing the same label or maybe some syntactic structure or maybe some particular language, so on and so forth. So let's say if we assume there's a list of S slicing functions, which we denote by slice subscript S, where S ranges from one to capital S. And each of this is a Boolean function indicating whether a given example E belongs to that slice S or not. So as in for text classification slicing function, which groups all the examples with the same label C would be this. So all the examples that have their Y or the label to be C are grouped together. And that is what forms X comma Y pairs. And this can be represented as a slice. So this is how you basically define it formally. And once you put every example into certain slice, the union of all the slices becomes your DS, which is the data set of all the slices that you have. Okay. And authors mention about one more terminology, which is F and M, where all the few short slices are referred as F and all the other slices that need not be augmented, which they call as many short slices are represented by capital M. So the example extrapolator, the EX2 is only trained on M slices and the model never sees anything from the F set. So which would mean, so if we again consider the example of that emoji, let's say, so here these three classes would make up M and this would make up F because this is the underrepresented slides. So the model that they tune on top of T5 is basically from the set M and it doesn't see F at any point of time. But once that model is trained, it is expected that the model would also generalize well for the set F. And that hypothesis basically comes from the underlying model T5 because it has all the world knowledge and it has been pre-trained on very large corpora. So as per my understanding, what's exactly happening is that let's say if this is the data set that we have, which is about classification and emojis. Now, since T5 is already trained on a lot of, lot of data, it would have also incurred emojis at many places. So by training a model again on just the emoji specific distribution, kind of tweaks the weight of T5 that takes care of emoji use cases. So you can think of something as, let's say this is a 2D plane and these are all the multiple distributions. So let's say this is about sentiment analysis. This is about emojis. These are all the name entities and so on and so forth. So this is the entire big distribution on which the T5 was trained. Now, since we specifically show M set to our model, we are tuning in this section of the weights. And now when the model sees something similar to emojis, it uses the information or the weights from this distribution to predict what should be there that usually co-occurs with such examples. So yeah, this is more or less how things are happening at the back end at very high level. So let's move forward. So yeah, we have seen F and M. So also it is important to note what authors say is that few short here would mean that the slices have very less examples, which is little unlikely because few short is usually used where you have less data for the entire problem that you have. Whereas in this case, for those slices, you have very less examples. The rest, you have enough examples for other slices that you have, which is represented by M. Okay. So now let's talk about the formal definition of EX2. They randomly sample K examples from every slice S and denote it as E1 to K. And we want to train a model that takes these K examples as input and tries to predict something from the same distribution. So the way basically they generate this input output pairs is like this. So let's say if we again consider this emoji example, what we had, we said that smiley gesture and animal would lie under the category M. So which means we'll be generating examples X and Y from here. 
So let's think of the example from Smiley. So if we consider this first one as a Y, then the input X would be any K samples that we sample from this distribution of Smiley. So let's say if we pick this, this, this and this. So all of these would become your X and you'd want to predict this Y. And similarly, you will iterate and give chance to every example over here to become Y and their corresponding X would be random samples of size K from the same distribution. So which means the number of examples that you generate would be based on the size of the distribution slice that you have. So yeah, that's what you can see in B figure also. Like we sampled four examples and we predicted one of the samples from there. Let's move forward. So now the question comes, what should be the value of K and how does it impact the performance? So for that, authors did experiment for varying value of k and plotted a graph of accuracy versus variation in k values. So if we see the section 4, so yeah, in this example if we see, as the k value increases from 1 to 10, this blue line that you see right, is how the accuracy varies. So which means if the value of k is equal to 1, which means you are trying to generate output y based on just one example from the same distribution. We seem to get performance as good as if we would have done no augmentation. So baseline basically stands for no augmentation at all. You are dealing with that skewed distribution. Upsampled as in for the few slices. You kind of duplicate some of the samples from there and try to balance it out. And EX2 is the method that we have been discussing that's based on sequence to sequence augmentation. But as soon as you increase the value of K to 2, 3 or 4, we can see a drastic increase in the accuracy numbers compared to no augmentation or vanilla amp sampling. We observe roughly 2% increase in the accuracy numbers. But also one interesting thing to note over here is, if we see this window, as you go from 5 to 10 let's say, the increase is not that much. Which means there has to be some middle ground. You cannot consider all the examples and generate one of the examples from there. That would be highly inefficient in computational terms. And also seeing this graph, we can observe that the value saturates pretty fast. That's the effect of K and how would you go about choosing it? Let's get back. So if we formally define the training procedure, let's say we have a data set D where we have S slices. So we have D1 to DS where each of DIs denote a different slice. We sample K examples from every specific slices. And we do the sampling uniformly without replacement. Which means we don't consider duplicate examples while we generate our X. So this is the training objective on which we optimize. So here M is that set from which we want to train our sequence to sequence model. And for every slice in that M, we get a prior probability of occurrence of that slice. So this is empirically derived based on the training data distribution that we have. Then for every data slice that you have, you iterate through all the examples E star and you sample K examples from every slice of that which becomes your X, where E star is your Y. Given these K examples, you want to accurately predict the Y value. So yeah, this is like learning the co-occurrence probabilities, or you can also think of Siebel algorithm, where based on the context, you're trying to predict something that occurs within that. Okay. To optimize this objective, we iterate about all the train slices M with every example. In each slice, we sample k other examples from the same slice excluding this. We optimize on the log likelihood. Yeah, so this is all we have already discussed in detail now. Let's move forward. So yeah, then they talk about exemplar deserialization. So here they define two functions which is to text and from text. So these are required because we know that T5 accepts plain text inputs and also outputs plain text. So whatever format data we have, we'll have to transform it to the way T5 would want it. So that's why we have this method to text. So this could be as simple as concatenating every example with a space or maybe with a pipe. So let's say if you're doing a classification problem and you did a group by based on the label, which becomes your slice. Now you have four sentences that you have sampled. You can join them with a pipe example. And this is what your to text function would do. And the reverse of this is what from text does. So once you generate the output on the other end, you should know the method to how did you encode it at the first place so that you can do the reverse of that and generate the actual examples again. So in this case, from text would kind of split at pipe and get the relevant output. Okay, let's move forward. Then the authors discuss if the extrapolator is allowed to cheat while determining the boundaries of the slice. 
So what that would mean is, let's say in the case of text classification, you have a label, then you have the text. So two function would kind of prepend the label name also to the input text while creating the sample X. So let's say if the X was play a song and Y is play music. So this will become the entire sample that goes as an input. But there are high chances that the model would take the advantage of the semantics of the label itself and not even consider what's written after that. And since we're using T5 as the base model, which has all the word knowledge, chances are very high like the model could just focus on the label and try to generate something from there and ignoring rest of the text that's written post that, resulting in memorization, which will again hamper the generalization abilities. So what authors do is, they ensure that two text anonymizes any slice information that might be present, so that it doesn't suffer the pitfalls that we've discussed earlier. Okay, let's move forward. So yeah, you have K examples from some distribution, you pass it through two text example and you get a big string. You sample example from the same distribution, and you pass it to from text function that returns the example after decoding it. So once you have generated augmentations, you take the union of what you had earlier and the new samples that you have added, you take the union of that and now you train your student model on this entire set that does the classification task. So yeah, I think now we are done with the paper because we have experiments and all. So it was a pretty interesting read because I found this to be something new like if you don't train on underrepresented slice and you have enough samples from rest of the slices and you kind of fine tune your model on such large scale pre-trained models let's say T5 then models kind of have the ability to also generalize to underrepresented slice which can be used for doing the augmentation. So this is clearly something new in the domain of augmentation I would say and considering the entire method this can easily be scaled to any kind of task that we have. It could be tabular, it could be vision, it could be speech and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's pretty good. So if you like such content, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Also share it across with your friends to whosoever is interested in such content. I'll meet you in the next one. Bye-bye.